They say that uh, music makes anything sound better. I would love to be able to have them just keep playing. Yeah. <laughs> so that I can, everything will sound better. I started from the bottom and now I'm here. I had to get it off my chest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I am nothing without you. How many of you all have said that to another person? Okay, um, I'm going to say that I probably did, but I practice selective amnesia, and I can't <laughs> remember that right now. Um, but yeah, I probably did in my lifetime. But I know, just like you, how often have you said that to Elohim? And just so you know that I call God Elohim, or spirit. You'll also hear me say Ashe, and that just means many blessings. May your blessings be manifested. Um, so, how many times have you said that to God? And I'm nothing without you. Or to recognize the reverence of the Holy Spirit and, and you're in need of the grace. We say it often. I know for me, and up until this lesson, I said it from a space of shame pity, unworthiness, and it wasn't until I was actually preparing for this that I honestly felt something different. And so just let me kind of share with you, even though I know that Hebrews 4.16 says, come boldly to the throne of God and ask when you are in need, I would still say to spirit, I am nothing without you from a space of inferiority and unworthiness. And as I was preparing, so let me kind of take you back as to how I even came up with this title, I Didn't Spirit Did. Spirit um, And I, I knew when, when Melinda, bless your heart, I want to thank you in your absence, uh, when she asked me to do this, I was like, okay, cool. Yeah, what did I just say? <laughs> <laughs> So she then says to me, Penny, I need you to give me a title, and I need you to give me a brief paragraph on what this talk is going to be on. I was like, oh, snap. Okay, we got to do that, too. Uh, and so I sit down, and my intellectual self came in. You know that person that has been a corporate trainer for almost 30 years. I'm, you know, I do this, you know, for I can eat this up in my, in my sleep. Oh, no problem. But if I was wrestling with it, I couldn't. What I had another title. I don't even remember what it is now. But it just wasn't flowing. And I always know when I'm out of step with spirit, when I'm trying to force something to happen. So I'm sitting there now with my head and my hands on the desk, at my desk, and I'm like, what the heck? I don't have anything. And then I say to my spirit guides, I am nothing without you. And instantly, they said back, we are nothing without you. Amen. My heart went into a place of humbleness that I cannot even describe. Wait a minute. Hold on. I can't say that to people. Because somebody's going to tell me, God don't need nobody. He's God all by himself. <laughs> You're right. And that's what made this even more humbling for me. That here is an omnipotent God with all power saying to me, I am nothing without you. Amen. And I was like, blow my mind. How can I tell anybody else that very thing? So I'm sitting there and I'm looking at the the, the scripture that I knew that I wanted to talk about. And I had the book. I knew that I wanted to go to lesson 154. And it's the title of that lesson is, I Am Among the Ministers of God. And here's the thing about that particular lesson. I had been playing that. I listened to an audible on an audible tape. And I had been listening to it for like two months in advance, just listening to it. And it stuck with me because I'm trying to move into my space as a minister of God. But let me be clear, a minister of God is not here. 
Because I was like, oh no, this is not my calling. A minister of God is anything that we do with passion and that we get into the spirit and we become God's messengers. And so in this, when I was reading and I knew I wanted, I'm sitting there and I'm wrestling with, I can't go and tell people that you said that you're nothing without us. I can't. And then I turned the book over to read the lesson again. Maybe spirit wanted me to go in another direction and my ego got in the way. And my eyes landed on this. In that lesson, it says that the Holy Spirit needs our voice, that he may be actually heard, okay? And he needs to speak through us, our hands to carry his message to those who actually need it. He needs our feet to actually take us there to the places, and I love this, take us to where he wills that those who wait in misery will be delivered, set free. And then finally he says, I need your will united with my own, okay, so that, that we may be true receivers. Now, let me just stop right there because true receivers of the gift, this is where I really kind of, yeah, Okay, fighting my own path. How many of us have resisted? God has said to us a gazillion times, this is what you're supposed to be doing. But because we think it's too easy, or we think nobody's going to believe us, we resist it. We fight against our own selves. And so I'm sitting there and I'm like, oh wow, okay. And the humbling feeling of every time I said, I'm nothing without you. Spirit is now saying to me that I'm nothing without you. And this is proof. And so uh, how many times have we read this over and over again? Now, my, many may say that's narcissistic. Okay. That is arrogant. But it actually speaks to the grandeur and deep love God has for us. And we are afraid to stand in that grandeur. We are afraid. One of my, I got my doctorate's degree in the success experience personalities. And we are so afraid to stand in our strength and our truth. But let me go back where it says he needs our will united with his own. Spirit will not do anything through us without our own consent. Amen. So we must give ourselves permission. And that self, I'll explain that in just a few moments. We must give spirit the permission to flow through us, to work through us. Without it, it just doesn't happen. And we stumble around trying, just like I was sitting at that desk, thinking about my ego and my, you know, all that I'm all about is more important. And I can, I can just take my intellect. Excuse me, I have a doctor's degree. I can do this. And it failed me that day, you know. I, I sucked. And I was like, oh my gosh, okay, now what? And this is where spirit is now teaching me that it's not about my intellect. It's about my heart being open and receptive to the guidance of who he is, to be in his will, to be in perfect step. I don't know how perfect it is because sometimes I'm stumbling all over the place. It's like dancing with a bad dance partner. It's all on your feet. <laughs> trying to lead, you know, stuff like that. You know, back in the day when we used to two-step. Okay, I'm aging myself. All right. So, again, I like I said, I wanted to come from lesson 154. Now, let me tell you why this lesson really became important to me. Because like I said, I had been kind of going over this lesson again and again for at least two months. And I was like, why is this message so important to me? I was playing it every morning. Now, I would continue, like, again, let me just step back. I went through the Course in Miracles for an entire year with my, my sister and my brother, Nancy and Bill. They are my sister and brother, okay? Amen. Might be confusing, but they are. We finally found each other, okay? So... I'm going through the whole Course in Miracles with them, and then this, this first of this year, I went back and I started just going, reviewing all of the lessons. We went through the whole book, 
But then I started reviewing the lesson when I got here, and this just really stuck with my spirit. I'm like, why is this sticking with me? So even though I would continue listening to the lessons for that day, I would still come back and repeat and listen to this lesson again. And I listened to it at night as I was going to sleep because I'm trying to convince myself that I'm among the ministers of God. Up until this, to this message, I didn't believe I was worthy of that. When Spirit gave me to write the book, giving myself permission, I went looking for everybody else's opinions on it. And that was not, I never found anything. And then Spirit said to me, it is for you to do. Now I really got scared. How am I going to tell anybody? I can't even give my own self permission. But I am in the process of practicing what that really means. And I had to move into the place of beginning to develop the whole concept and ideology around what it means to give myself permission. And so as I read this, I, I literally, you can read this for yourself, but the first one, it says, let us not be e either arrogant nor falsely humble. Now let me tell you how about that, that message just kind of, bam, hit me. First off, in the same lesson, Spirit also says that we, the difference between those ministers or messengers called by heaven opposed to those who are self-appointed is that when the message comes to us, we know that first, it's a lesson for us to learn. So for every one of us, including me, who felt like life beat me up, everything I'm going through, God doesn't like me, it is literally your lesson preparing you for what your calling is. Everything I've gone through in my life was to prepare me for this moment. Freedom summoned me here. And neither did I didn't know it, but then here I am. All that I went through, I thought, God doesn't like me. He loves everybody else, just not me. I see everybody else getting blessed, just not me. And it was not true. And I have at the end of every one of my podcasts, I say, we are never victims of life. We are always student of purpose. What is, what is God teaching you, preparing you for? And you haven't stood in that space among the ministers of God. And so how this actually came about is that a few months ago, I decided, okay, I'm going to stop fighting. I'm going to stop resisting spirit. I'm just going to go ahead. And then spirit says to me, he had been telling me for years that my purpose was to heal the ouch within the African-American community that is experienced by discriminative racism. And I was like, uh-uh. I ain't going there. First off, we hard-headed. Um, no, not getting into that whole thing. And I resisted, so I was having my Jonah moment. And so everything that I tried to do just kind of sucked. It got there, but then it fizzled out. I was never committed to it. But this time, Spirit said, you, I need you to start a center called the Learning Spa. And I, I jumped on it. I got it all excited. So I'm now getting put it on Kickstarter to raise funds to start this learning spot, this community of healing the ouch for the African-American community. And I decided I'm going to chronicle my process, my journey, and I am going to put it on my YouTube channel. So the first two times that I published you know, the video, I said stuff like, I am so, I don't know what I'm doing, I'm scared, I was using some colorful words, I'm so scared, I don't know what I'm doing. And I posted, and I thought I'm proud, I'm proud to post it because I'm at least being honest. I'm scared and I don't know what I'm doing. The second time I did the same thing. Said it several times, I'm scared, I don't know what I'm doing. I posted it, got up, walked away, and then Spirit said to me, stop saying that. You're not scared because you know we are always here with you. And you know exactly what you were supposed to be doing. You're just saying that out of habit. That was a clutch my pearls moment. <laughs> I'm wearing those today. Oh my God. <laughs> but in that, it also said, when it talked about that first one, it says, let us neither be arrogant or falsely humble. As I grappled with what Spirit said to me, you're just saying that out of habit. I started then thinking, oh wow. 
Could it be me saying that I'm fearful and I don't know what I'm doing is false humility because I'm afraid of rejection. I think that if I tell people that, oh, I don't know what I'm doing, oh, I'm not sure, then it makes me not threatening. And as a black woman, I'm often accused of being threatening. And so I've learned how to dial it down. But Spirit said to me, stop saying that. And I was like, okay, zip, gone. No one can say that anymore. But how do I now present myself without coming across? Coming across is aggressive. And then I'm learning, practicing the issue or the, the essence of love. The, that, that brought me to the second part. It's not our part to judge our worth. Because we have a tendency to want to judge who we are. We are our worst critics. And we all know that. Nobody. We can find the most comforting, empathetic words for others. But when it comes for our, to ourselves, we don't have that. And I always tell people, trust me, I'm talking to, this is a lesson that I am learning. I am one who literally can beat myself up. And I always tell people, I'm a recovering, I'm recovering from low self-esteem. <laughs> people say to me, no way, you don't know my story. Because every backstory has a story. And that's what people don't understand. So while I judge my worth, God always saw me as the place that I am going now. And I can't say that I'm fearful. I can't say that I'm uncertain anymore. Because I know they're always with me. And to now know that God needs me as much as I need him is humbling in and of itself. And so going back to, again, uh, my fear of rejection it's been around for a long time, a long time. And so trying to come through that, I'm now asking Spirit, how do I move through something that is so deeply embedded in me? And he says, you still don't get it. Now we're still having this conversation because I'm still wrestling with the fact of, I need, I mean, I'll, I'm nothing without you and Spirit telling me that. And so I'm wrestling with that, and, and I'm like, how do I move beyond this fear of rejection and to be among the ministers of God that I am called to be, to step into that place? And as I said, ministry doesn't mean right here. It is in so many versions, and I'm looking at all of the ministries here that are going, you know, just... They're being called into the light. And even this lesson says, you're being called into the light, but you're still not coming. You're being given the message to share with others, but you won't share it. But it's not until you share it that you actually know you own it. And so in learning this lesson, in embracing my place in this ministry, then I now, by saying no, the message is for me first. And once I can embrace it wholly and set aside my ego and say, yeah, yeah, he's talking to you, then I can share it with others from a sense of authenticity. You know, they say, we always say, it takes one to know one. Yeah, I can, I can come from that space when I'm sharing what, what God is teaching me. Because nine times out of ten, I'm still in the process of, of, you know, the practice of it. I haven't got there yet. But I know that they are always with me. And when I stumble and fall, that's okay. My perfectionism would have said, you know, you're done with it now. Don't even try it. You've embarrassed yourself. The Spirit says, no. You just learned something else. Okay? So when I'm looking at this, and I said, the Spirit says, you still don't get it. Because I'm still wrestling with, you know, I am nothing without you. God is saying that to me. Omnipotent God is telling me that they're nothing without me. And he says, you don't get it. We're one voice. 
You're me. I'm you. We're just one voice. We're one heart. We're one thought. We're one movement. And that's who we are. And until you recognize that penny, then you will be forever. You have to understand. I, just to explain my little picture here, the graphic is, I found this graphic years and years ago, but I put the words on top of it. But the graphic is shows a little heart. And I always saw that as myself, the heart of me. But it's in a room, an empty room, hiding in a corner. But if you look at the bigger part of it, there's light shining there that is calling me out of the corner. But I'm too afraid. I'm huddled into that corner of an empty room, afraid to be among the ministers of God because I'm not sure what that's going to cost me. Let's just be honest. <clears throat> I'm not sure what being the minister of God means who I'm going to have to let go of, how my life is going to have to change. I'm more afraid of that, of coming into my purpose, my strength, than anything else, so I stay hidden in the corner, even though I know there's light, and maybe I hear a party going on over there, but I'm not moving because I'm too scared. And so Spirit says, until you are able to understand that we are one, our divine conscious self is one. Now, I'm not talking about that self that we create for public consumption. You know, we create this self that we want everybody to see, and be proud of, and give us all kinds of accolades and applause, you know? And that's temporary, because based on whatever their agenda is for the day, or their attitude, you you know, you might get a thumbs down that day. So you were too dependent upon it. And that's where I was. I was so, and I'm sitting here, and God is saying to me, this is what I want you to tell them. And I'm like, I'm so worried about what y'all gonna say. How y'all gonna judge me? Because I have the arrogance to come up here and say, and Spirit, like, you don't get it. You are the one self. And that self that I'm talking about is the sacred, expressive life force. That's us. And until we own, take ownership of it, we will remain in that corner, afraid to come out of the light. Because that sacred expressive life force is God himself. Waiting for us to hear that they need us just like we need them. And so as I'm still, I'm still wrestling, I'm not going to lie, I'm still wrestling. Because I now need to reclaim my truth. Because I've heard this a thousand times. How many of you guys have heard it? Especially those who are students of Course in Miracles. How many times have we heard? That we are God incarnate. Yes. That he can do nothing yet but through us. Hello. But we do not accept that. So let me tell you a little experience that I had. I'm, this happened just prior to me coming to this. I was in meditation. And I'm still really for the fact of God saying, you're just doing that out of habit. And I'm in meditation. Now forgive me because it might make bring me to tears because it's just that dear to my heart. And I'm in meditation and he, he's telling me how he must he loves me. And I'm like, well, why can't I go ahead and claim what you are calling me to? Why am I still so caught up in other people's opinions of me? Why? And I'm in meditation and he takes me back. I literally, it's like, rewind. And it takes me back to my life when I was 13. And he tells me, I'm seeing myself in the room at 13 years old. I came from a very abusive home. And I had asked the spirit that day. I had just gotten beat or whatever. And I was sent to the room and I'm crying. And, and I remember we grew up in the church, heavily in the church. And, and I remember a scripture saying that God would be the mother to the motherless and the father to the fatherless. And, and so that day, I'm just fed up of the abuse. And I asked Spirit to change things for me. That I needed him to change things for me. And I needed him to give me a sign that he sees me. And he knew me. And the sign that I asked for was I wanted to hear music coming from this little picture that had a little piano in it with angels all around it. 
Uh, it's funny now as, as an adult. <laughs> but okay. And I'm just bawling, I'm just crying, I'm just crying from, you know, and I'm asking Spirit to just be with me, just give me some sign that you love me, that you're there. And I cry myself to sleep. And I find I'm awakened by my mother screaming my name with cuss words attached to it. And I was like, I woke up and I realized I hadn't heard the sound. And I said to God, since you don't care about me, I don't care about you. But when he, when he took me back that day to when I was 13, he said that I began to that moment asking him to forgive me because I didn't mean it. And he says, no sweat. You weren't talking to me. You didn't denounce me. You denounced that illusion of me that you, others, create of me. That quid pro quo God. That God that says, if you do this, then I'll do this. You denounced a God of conditions. Amen. Mm. And I'm not that person. And in that moment, he did fast forward me to when I was 16 years old. And I'm walking along the street with my baby in my hand. My daughter was maybe two, three months old at that time. I had no place to go. I had no place to live. And I was walking along the street saying to her, I am going to find us a place to live. I knew it in the bowels of my body. I knew it in the depths of my heart that I, I didn't ask anybody their permission. I didn't ask them what they thought. I just knew that I was going to find a place to live. And I did that very day. When I followed my dream to become a police officer, I didn't ask anybody's opinion. I did it. And Spirit reminded me that you have to remember who you are and stop expecting others to tell you. And now I'm in the practice of understanding who really am I, you know? Who am I supposed to be? And he says to me, until we reclaim our divine truth, we will receive a thousand miracles and then a thousand more, but we will not realize that God has never denied us the most tiniest blessings because we will not receive our truth, stand in our power, that we stand and sit in the corner our sacred expressive life force, God, sitting there, we relegated to the corner in an empty room, waiting for it to, for us to acknowledge the power that we are. So now, I realize that I am as God created me. Amen.
God's physical plane. I am open and receptive to the divine guidance of all of my ancestors and spiritual gods. And I surrender the sacred expressive life force that it may be seen, heard, and felt in its own way. 